uh, committee staff learned that despite the efforts of the Office of uh, Management and Budget, are referred to as OMB, the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board and the federal agencies to make sure that recipients knew what they required to report errors still occurred. For example, the Federal Highway Administration released its own job estimation guidance during the first reporting cycle, even after the OMB released updated guidance for calculating jobs, FHFA again offered a different model mere days before the end of the second reporting cycle. So Mr. Schultz, which jobs model did California use for reporting its highway numbers during the second reporting cycle? And what is the difference between the two models and how much do the two estimates vary? And then I'll go to uh, Ms. Calhoun. And let me just ask you, Calhoun, excuse me, are there other uh, instances where OMB and Agency Recovery Act guidance uh, differ? And what can be done to ensure that the OMB and the agencies work in concert so that recipients can report active data rather than spend their time deciphering for federal entities to follow. So Mr. Schultz. Yeah. Very much appreciate your question. Uh, in the second quarterly reporting, California used the new guidance uh, for all of its agencies that came out uh, December 18th. We were told a couple of days uh, before the reporting period that FHWA would like us to use a different calculation. And we had conversations both in Washington and with the regional office. And given the concern that we had because we were getting conflicting guidance, we hadn't seen anything official. And FHWA was saying, well, we should do this. I wrote uh, the head of OMB and other officials to say that California was going to, fo to, to follow the guidance that was put out uh, countrywide uh, by OMB. So in the first recording period, um, I think as the committee remembers, there was a job calculation that was based on jobs created or saved. And the governor of this state, many governors and the National Governors Association, I believe many members of Congress, did not think that that was an accurate predictor of the, if you will, uh, sort of number of jobs created in uh, the country. And so we lobbied very actively through the National Governors Association and with Congress people, and we're able to get that second quarter calculation changed to jobs funded, which is a better calculation, if you will. And so we've complied with both, if you will, the federal government guidance in the first, which is created or saved. The second, which is funded, which means, I think, to your point, it's apples and oranges. And so these continuous shifts, we work very much in partnership, but we have been in almost every program underscoring to the federal government that we need one set of guidance as opposed to the various agencies uh, giving conflicting information. I think we hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and that's you know certainly something that JO has recommended to, or, or we did recommend it only adopt our recommendations to simplify and to provide some very specific guidance on you know what do you mean by full farm equivalents because people were were applying the guidance but in different ways they were interpreting it differently in the first round in particular um, as far as your, your question on FHWA and OMB there were some issues there they my understanding is they have worked those out they've had some discussions back in DC and have worked those out so hopefully we'll we won't run into those problems but I know that it, it caused some extra problems certainly for you guys and in, in getting you know kind of red flags on the numbers when perhaps they didn't need to be getting flags and had to do some research. So uh, I think this is an evolving process that is, is going to get better and better as, as we go along. But cer certainly the simplification of the, of the jobs calculation approach is, is going to help a lot. I just heard from a member of our staff, the state stimulus directors are meeting in, in Washington and I'm here, someone went on, on my behalf and OMB did announce today that the OMB rules that we followed uh, are in place that FHWA should not be given you know, I just want all of you 
to understand the reason why we're having this hearing out here right in the seat of where we are highly challenged is so that we can take your input back. Now this is OJT. Uh, we haven't had this kind of recession since the 30s, and at that time people jumped out of windows. Uh, we are the safety net. And so the stimulus, and I sit on the oversight committee, uh, and I have a subcommittee, and uh, I remember, the chair will remember, it was, uh, you weren't chair then, but it was September uh, 17th of 2008 that Paulson came to us and said, the sky is falling, the house is on fire, and so on. And we moved out very, very quickly to put the fire out. So the stimulus and the recovery act, it was put out there. And so now we're trying to do it right. So. Anything you want to tell us, this is your opportunity. Uh, I'd like to move on. Federal agencies are responsible for reviewing uh, recipient data on the use of the Recovery Act funds in order to identify the data errors. So likewise, recipients who delegate reporting responsibilities to sub-recipients must review the sub-recipient data to flag potential errors. So, Mr. Payne, yes, uh, what procedures do the California Department of Education utilize in its reviews of school district data? Well, as I mentioned, most of the reviews of school district data happen at the same time that we do our ongoing monitoring of those exact, of those exact programs. And the, uh, the first thing I'll acknowledge is that any monitoring program can always use uh, improvement. We are actively engaged in improving those um, those systems, we are uh, uh, engaged with the U.S. Department of Education to uh, um, uh, put in place sort of risk-based systems of monitoring that we'll be rolling out rather soon uh, from our department with those districts uh, moving forward. We are taking quite seriously, especially the uh, remittance of interest from uh, early drafts of, of stimulus funds and, um, and as I mentioned in my comments, my prepared comments, taking very seriously our obligations under um, cash management principles. Great, I'd like to get back to Mr. Schultz. Uh, California uses a centralized recipient reporting system. What procedures did your office utilize to review the recipient data? Um, significant. Um, we have put in place something that's called the CAT system, uh, which was put together to be a database which taking all of the information from the recipients and the sub-recipients department by department and putting it into the system and scrubbing very specifically all of the data. And so if you sort of travel it down and take the Caltrans, the Department of Education, Caltrans works with more than 400 local transit agencies. They themselves have over 900 individual contracts that make up that $2.5 billion and we have quality control data reporting managers in our computerized center that take all of that data, that go through the data, that bring back to the department when there's an error, and literally work record by record in order to ensure that the data that's being put up is correct. If we have a problem in terms of the federal government comes back and says, no, this zip code plus four wasn't right, or some of those other issues, <laughs> Uh, we are on the departments like, uh, you know, like a, a bee on honey, and we go back and we literally go contract by contract, award by award to do that. In addition, we've done our own readiness reviews and spot checks to make sure on an ongoing basis, in addition to working with the auditors and with Laura's office as well, to make sure that they're not systems problems, systemic problems, in those departments. So it's a whole series of things that we're continuously doing. Uh, what I try to inform my colleagues of all the time is that California is like three different states, <laughs> Northern Central and Southern California, and trying to monitor and uh, be sure that waste, fraud, and abuse does not occur uh, is a real serious challenge. Now, I was uh, in the Senate when Jerry Brown uh, got rid of our planes, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, to be able to send inspectors down and people to oversee how things are going. 
we didn't have our private jets anymore, so we had to use commercial airlines, and he really cut down on the travel. We saw Laura uh, waste occurring, and we had no one to oversee it. So can I direct uh, to you, what have you learned in your position now that we need to be aware of as we deal with these funds? Um, <coughs> Congresswoman, I, <coughs> I would say what I've seen at the very front end, and as I interviewed each department that was getting recovery funds, uh, and asked, what is your plan to oversee these dollars? Um, many of the uh, managers said, oh, you know, we're used to getting federal money. We're going to do what we've always done, which caused me to catch my breath. Um, because I understand very clearly that the President and Congress has said to us, look, we're giving you more money than ever before. We want you to spend it faster than ever before, but we want you to spend it better than ever before. And this is at a time when government has less resources than ever before. So it's a challenge, it's a real challenge. And what, I, what concerns me the most is once the money leaves the state and is going out there, and I've, since I've, my, my, most of my, all my life in elected office has been at the local level. So I carefully am listening to the mayors saying they want more flexibility. But we also have to have more oversight. Because quite frankly, the dollars that concern, concern me the most are not the dollars in state government. It's once they leave state government. Um, and I'm not criticizing any one department at the state level, but I don't think our, our scrutinizing of dollars that we give out, state of California give out, is robust at all. And, and so my eyes are especially the dollars that have left the state. Uh, BSA is doing an outstanding job of getting state departments to be in better shape, but what's called the sub-recipient monitoring is not robust enough. And in terms of dollars for oversight, it's always the money that you cut first. Because it's not about the direct delivery of services, it's about watching over money. But the money that's spent on oversight usually more than pays for itself uh, by preventing problems or finding them and collecting money that's been misspent or inappropriately misspent. I wish there was some way for us in government to come up with that magic formula that says for every program created, X percent should be set aside specifically for oversight. And I would volunteer at any moment to come to Washington to speak to the Senate, who has not acted on your bill, Congressman Kelly, um, to say, you know, you're asking us to spend this better than ever before. And my hope is when the recovery dollar is over, one of the things that's left behind are better operations of government at every level, including better over and better oversight will deliver better operations. Right. Let me, the gentlewoman's time has expired. We can do another round, but let me know you okay. raise the time. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, just a great dialogue, and I'm very pleased that uh, this is all coming out. Uh, I have some specific uh, questions for Ms. Calhoun. Um, where we have, uh, and I'm going back to the uh, High Speed Rail Authority, um, where we find not only that they have employed over a hundred and some odd consultants and spending a lot of money that they don't even have the ability to actually build yet because they don't have a lot of the things done, um, like right-of-way acquisition and all of that good stuff. Um, what's happening? Who's looking over their shoulder to ensure that that money that was given to California for that specific purpose is not being misspent or abused? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's an area that um, our California Recovery Act team hasn't looked at, but back in Washington, D.C., we have teams that are looking at kind of the overall uh, uh, high-speed rail issue, and I know in particular they're looking at the oversight that the uh, Federal uh, Railways Administration is, is to cover, and it's, it's a new role for them, so whether or not, you know, they can do the oversight they need, but then it has to, of course, trickle down, you know, the local level. It's, it's a lot of money. Again, we haven't looked at that, so I don't have to. Is the dollars, nobody's looking over how they're spending it? Ms. Hall? Uh, Congress, Congresswoman, we actually are currently auditing the High Speed Rail Authority. We were requested by the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, which is a bicameral committee in the legislature, to audit the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, and we are also in, included in bond language 
to continue to monitor any bonds. And certainly the voters of California approved the major bond measure last fall. Um, so we will be issuing a report on and looking at consult use of consultants, looking at their business plan, looking at any strategic plan. Uh, we'll be issuing that report in late April of this year, so we'd be happy to share that with well, this okay. committee. Just focus on that. What are you going to do once you issue the recommendations? Well, I'd like to talk about the follow-up process that my well, office has. Let me stop you for a second, okay. because I'm telling you that uh, one of my base sense was issued a very good honor report and they have totally ignored it. And nobody's going after them, and they're wasting taxpayer money. And nobody's doing anything about it at the state level. Well, when we issue audit reports, we have a follow-up process. Those entities that we audit are required to report back to my office. 60 days, six months, one year. And what I do is I share that information with the legislature. And the legislature typically has oversight hearings. In fact, we're going to have... We had Unfortunately, they hand, the, the fox is in the hen house. Sorry. I was going to say, uh, when we issued the state energy, the report on the state energy program, both the Joint Legislative Audit Committee and the Budget Committees called the administration before the committee and asked for progress reporting. So it's not like the audit is done, we make recommendations and no one pays attention. There is a continuous follow-up process to make sure that recommendations that are made are paid attention to and implemented. Apparently in this case they're not being paid attention to and nobody that I know of has either contacted any of the local cities to ensure that that entity is actually following those audit recommendations. Is this, this is an audit at the local level? Uh, is it, it is a basin water level. Um, but anyway, that's one of the things. And, and to Ms. Calhoun, um, when you do your, your uh, request for proposal, I call them request for proposals for, for uh, bids, do you specify um, reporting back uh, from the vendors, the whether they're their vendor, um, um, rehire, new, new hires, rehires, or retain job, and what time frames you give me. Because you were saying that they don't tell you, you go back to request information from them for the stimulus effect on jobs and hires. What I was mentioning is, is um, if this is, if I'm understanding your question, is, is the Department of Education wasn't reporting the vendor jobs? Is that the issue? Right, because those are other jobs created. Yes, yes, and those that would be the kind of jobs basically where um, a school district might enter into a contract with a vendor to provide some direct training. No, but are you getting that information up front? In other words, when you issue out the money, do you and at that time, same point ask for information, feedback for reporting on those specific things to keep going back and asking the questions from them? Well, that's something, you know, we're, we're the auditors, so we're not the ones that, that would do that. But what we told the department um, and some of the, the uh, school districts that we've talked to that, that had a number of, of contracts out there is that if you can put some language in the contract up front, which uh, we do see other agencies requiring, but we did see uh, the school districts doing this, but if you put language in the contract up front that requires those vendors to do the jobs reporting and the other requirements under ARA, then it happens automatically. But right now what's happening is the school districts are having to scramble, call vendors, uh, do a survey. I mean, so it, it, but we do, the ones we have talked to so far, and we'll be working with uh, the, the, Mr. Payne and others at mm -hmm. CDE, they have told us in the future now, they are going to put language specifically in their contracts that requires the vendors to support the job. So hopefully we kind of nip it in the bud, but uh, this is more <coughs> And, and just to dovetail in what Ms. Hall and I were talk talking about in, in this water basin issue, also Title 16, since California received the major portion of 135 million stimulus funding for uh, expansion of Title 16 recycled water projects, those are critical. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess the kickoff of this uh, hearing, did you allow us permission to revise and extend our remarks? Yes. Okay. And also, did you give us permission that any questions we're not able to get answers from today that the panelists will give us answers in writing? Yeah, we sure did, yes. Thank you, sir. Um, my staff told me I was a little hard, and I said, you know, this is Washington. You know, you have no idea what it's like where we work. So for any of you, I apologize. It's just we have, we're used to limited time. we got to get the answers to the questions, and these are big issues. So we hope we're not throwing any of you off, because that, that certainly is not my intention. I spent 18 years in D.C. I know exactly what you Okay, all right. This is 
So my first my first question is for Ms. Howell or Ms. Schick. Um, Caltrans originally lacked adequate internal controls, and it has improved its procedures to better ensure that it disperses federal funds to local agencies only for reasonable costs and were claimed. However, according to the same report, Caltrans has not completed any of its process reviews, the main method for determining if local agencies are in compliance with all federal laws. Are you aware of that? Are you following up on it? I was aware, the, the first part of your question I was aware of, that was an issue that we raised in the report that we issued in December, but it's my understanding that Caltrans modified its practices as of September 09, so when we go back in, which will be relatively soon, we will follow up on any previous findings to confirm that they are following those practices. The second half of your question, I'm not familiar with that concern. Okay, if you could follow up with this panel, sure. we'd appreciate it. And I can uh, give you my next one between the two of you this year. Um, Ms. Howell, particularly regarding education, as I said, I had approached the chairman because I was quite concerned with what's happening in education. And let me start off with Ms. Calvo. I seem to recall when we first went to do the recovery, um, Governor Schwarzenegger came to Washington. There was a concern that California was going to get a certain amount of money, and he made various commitments. Do you remember what that was all about? Does that? I can you be a little more specific, but commitments about? I believe that there was a different way that the governor was proposing to use some of the funds. The, the president originally was planning on withholding some funds, and then we went ahead and did it. Are you familiar with that? No, story? I'm, I'm okay. not sure. I'll supply it in writing. I thought myself it was going to be my folder, but it wasn't, so I'll supply mm -hmm. it. But coming back to my question, uh, Ms. Howell and Mr. Payne, uh, could you please supply to this uh, body a report based upon education, K through 12 and higher ed, uh, what, what have been the salaries over the last 12 to 24 months? What have been the bonuses? And where have been the cuts? Because from everything that I'm reading, um, I'm hearing teachers, positions are on the line, but what else is going on? And I guess what my impression was of all the money that was coming that was supposed to help stabilize, it doesn't seem like it's much better. Um, it seems like it's about the same. So, and if you could really help us with a subsequent very detailed report of what's happening specifically with education and some real hard numbers would be very helpful. And that's K-12, Cal State, UC, all of it. Um, my next question is weatherization. Ms. Howell, you said that there were not agencies in Los Angeles that could not cover and it wasn't ready. Well, yesterday I met with Derek Simpson, who's the head of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership, regarding a project his organization applied for funding with the Recovery Act dollars through the Community Services Development Fund. His organization received the contract, received the RFP in July, I'm sorry, received a contract in July, um, signed the contract in August, and although they began providing the services and everything in July, they didn't receive any funding until December. In addition to that, weatherization, they applied in conjunction with the Job Corps. And both of those organizations have long history of doing work. And yet, they were recently told in late December that, oh, now all the RFP work that was done for six months, and supposedly they were in the top three, it went to the original provider who does most of this. Now, I'll tell you, that's not what the recovery dollars were for. If you notice the questions that I asked the mayors, the question was, what new and preserved jobs have you done? And many of us, although we wanted to help people save their current jobs, we were also concerned with increased unemployment. And if all we got out of this was the jobs that we saved and we haven't addressed the growing unemployment, we're still going to have some of the same problems. So I'd like to ask if you could go back and look at that weatherization contract, look at who finally got it and why was it that many of these local groups who were working very well respected suddenly after going through the whole process for six months were now told, okay, we're not going to do that, we're just going to give it to so-and-so. Because that was not the and I think the results show that you failed in terms of adequately dispersing the weatherization funds. So I don't know if it's now a panic, oh, we didn't get it done, so let's just use whoever we had, after you've already done this other work. I think there's a number we can provide you, a chronology and all that information if you would like. I think the original strategy was, given the growth in the program, was to go with the existing providers as much as possible in the 42 uh, areas, if you will, and there are 36 contracts in place. 
think what happened during that process, and it does raise the point that, that you do, that there were a number of those existing providers who said we're not interested in doing ARA. Um, and part of that had to do with one, either the Recovery Act paperwork, two, the Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements, um, and some that were on, you know, sort of probation, if you will. And so I think that we moved in to a phase where yesterday, for example, I was on the phone with a couple of people from the construction and building trades because the question was, we have programs. We're absolutely happy to come out and be um, you know, sub-providers. So I was asking our folks, well, why didn't we go there first? And the issue was about the existing providers. There is one area of LA um, that um, there will now be sort of a bifurcated RFP, and I think that may be the instance that you're talking about. And part of that is that uh, the way that the contracting went, in short, um, the contractors would not be ready for the RFPs until August of 2010, when there is a deadline of 30% at the end of September. So the providers that did bid in that occasion will get to bid on the existing programs. They just won't be able to bid on the R. But I'm happy to write up and give you a section-by-section a, uh, -section accounting, and whether that's the one or another one. But the program overall has, is in a vastly different place than it was as uh, the auditor and I were talking about. Um, and two, those remaining areas are sort of being closed up so that to the point that we've got 94% of all of the contracts that need to be done that represent 94% of the homes are done. But I'm happy to provide them to you. Mr. Chairman, can I get 30 last seconds? Uh, you yes. gentlewoman, additional 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Schiff, um, the pace of the federal outlay of California highway projects continues to be slower than the national average. In addition to that, when we look at the maintenance of effort burdened with one of the worst budget deficits in the nation, it's questionable whether California and its localities will be able to meet its MOE obligations. Under these circumstances and the allocations, do you think California can do it? And, I, I, uh, and I'm also turning and to the chair of the Recovery Task Force on that because it's not an area of expertise at this time for me. Um, and he's nodding his head that we will meet those obligations, but what I can't answer is how. And but before I turn it to him, and in terms of the you know shovel ready and moving quick, I think one of the things that we've absolutely seen is an underscoring of our knowledge that government doesn't move quickly. One of the things I hope comes out of this is a laundry list of all the steps that projects have to go through and our understanding and looking at the timeline attached to each one and looking for not getting rid of regulations and important policy goals, but how does government move things more quickly as we do when there are earthquakes and, and uh, nature made disaster, how do we translate that kind of expediting and working together? Uh, to a man-made disaster of, of the type that's facing us today. But I do have to turn to the chair of the task force in terms of how Caltrans is um, It has been uh, both in GAO and a little bit, I think, in the state auditor's report an issue. Um, we have gone back and we will be submitting a revised maintenance of Everett certification. We are 100% confident that we will be able to meet it. I'm happy to provide you with, you know, complete information. Thank you very much. Uh, let me, um, uh, the Oversight Committee had a, had a hearing and we learned that priority had not been given to economically distressed areas. Uh, when selecting recovery and highway construction projects, despite a clear mandate, as a result, the Secretary of Transportation, Rayla Hood, and Federal Highway Administrator Victor Mendez worked with me to draft guidance which addressed this issue. However, it has come to my attention that when the new guidance was applied in California, the numbers of counties uh, considered distressed became all counties. That appears to be a way to get around guidelines. Ms. Calvone, uh, uh, is 
change their uh, allocation of the, the funds. But it is something, you know, they're continuing to I don't have discussion with uh, back in Washington with the department. I think, Mr. Chairman, there's two issues at play in the specific instance that you're talking about. There are some state confidentiality laws that with the four new criteria that have come out um, are not apples to oranges, if you will, in the way that the Federal Department of Transportation wants to do this. And so we're trying to work out a better way to define it so that there's a more accurate accounting of which counties specifically are uh, economically distressed. Um, on a second account, we also have a number of programs where um, you know, the requirement may be, say, 20%. Um, we have some individual policies to try and spread uh, the Stimulus Act dollars to more uh, economically distressed, disadvantaged communities than the Recovery Act requires. But in the specific instance that you're talking about, we are in discussions about how to, to better implement that provision. Yeah, no, um, I mean, Ms. Richardson uh, sort of said this kind of plain talk because we push it too far. But let me tell you what it seems to me that there's some rotten in the country. That's what it seems to me. You know, I mean, it just, that just doesn't add up.
monitor different agencies. Um, another thing that needs to change, and the governor's part at work on it, is to put real meaning into transparency. So, for instance, the first few weeks I was in Sacramento, I was talking to state departments, and one of them mentioned that they have state, you know, they have auditors, and I leaned across the table and said, well, that's great, can I go online and see the audits? I, 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 I must have said something bad, because they recoiled. So we don't put our, we don't put our, our reports online. Well, the governor almost immediately issued an executive order to start building up his transparency website and said, you know all those reports sitting in your drawers? I want them online where people can see because, because daylight and, and part of the Recovery Act is about transparency. Because when you put the light of day on things, it, it's amazing what starts to happen. And so, uh, Congressman, that's very much why um, I am blasting my reports out as much as I can and turn to the media as a partner because so often when we shove things down, how do you share, how do the other work investment boards up and down the state uh, become aware of, of problems and things they should do differently if, if I'm not sharing what I found at that, at that first work investment board that I saw? So it, I'm not giving you specific things that your committee can do. Um, because I sure would like that bill passed out of the Senate. But I, I think the calling for robust accountability, not just at the end of the day, but all the way through, and having hearings like this and asking tough questions goes a long, long way uh, to forcing state and local government to show you that we are spending federal dollars well. All right. Let me uh, ask you this, Mr. Payne. the chancellor of the schools, the mayor is in charge of the, of the, of the, of the or has the overall responsibility for education and for any reason that they're not doing it right and the people can vote the mayor out and that kind of thing. Here we have a situation where that's not the case. And since the California Department of Education does not fall under the auspices of the governor and therefore outside of the authority of both the recovery IG and the recovery task force, what exact methods are in place to deter any uh, waste, fraud, and abuse from the recovery dollars? I mean, I don't know how we get to this. How do we, we avoid this? Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a great question and a legitimate question. And although we don't fall under the specific uh, guidelines, uh, or at least the, the specific offices of the governor's office, we do have a history of working with the governor's office on these exact uh, issues. Um, on our website, we have posted uh, a, a lot of guidance and, and data for school districts to cool down. Uh, we have uh, sent proactively data to them about waste, fraud, and abuse. We have um, conducted webinars the same. The, Ms. Chick has done exactly the same work and has, has done the communication as well. Um, we have a, a cooperative working relationship on just those issues. I think that um, uh, the reality is that is that we're um, we're actively engaged in monitoring our school districts, and, um, and um, I appreciate the um, the, the uh, suggestion, perhaps that um, um, the monitor monitee relationship can be interesting at times. Uh, I would ask you to just ask the school district whether um, they think there's a particularly cozy relationship with the Department of Education, because we hear it often that they're not uh, they're not particularly happy. With say to them about monitoring their activities. Um, and we're quite active with them in doing that. And it's a, it's a, it, we find ourselves in that situation quite often. We, we are, it's a, it's a lovely relationship. We ship them a whole bunch of money. And at the same time, we then come back to them and say, now you've got to be doing it right. We're, we're very active in that. And we're very active in sort of dinging them when they're not doing it right uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Sometimes it's good to be from out of town. Mr. Schultz, I guess you heard about that great relationship between the education and, and of course, the governor's office. I mean, I'd like to get your comments on that. Well, because that's sort of unusual. Well, it, it is unusual, as I understand it. Um, 
sure that people were using the new uh, job calculation. We did a Recovery Act bulletin that we provided to the committee, and we've done individual meetings uh, with departments. Um, so um, it, it is an interesting relationship and something that we have to deal with. We work very much in partnership with the department. Uh, doesn't mean we always agree. The governor and a separate constitutionally elected official can disagree. Uh, they've come together on things recently like race to the top. Uh, but we had a difference of opinion in terms of definitions. Uh, how you get to the top? Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. well, um, I think one of the things the Recovery Act keeps highlighting is um, how government operates in terms of wars and silo and how important it is for us to work together. So I would just publicly offer, although my shop is small, that um, all of the state departments receiving recovery dollars, except for the Department of Education, have signed MOUs with my office, giving me the authority and the possibility to do these on the ground in real time spot checks. And I would offer uh, whatever help my small shop can give to the superintendent and the Department of Education, and would love to have them sign one of those MOUs with me. And, and this is I think why you can see that in addition to the task force, the governor uh, appointed Florida the first in the nation of its kind because he wanted to ensure that as we were implementing and providing the right oversight, that the money was spent not only efficiently and effectively, but in the right way. So we all try and work in a strong partnership, especially with the locals. I know a number of the committee members brought up the locals. Uh, there are many locals that are getting direct federal money, and we have spent uh, in incredible amount of time uh, introducing federal officials to state officials, supporting their projects. Because when I was listening to the mayor, we understand about the flexibility, but we're actually going into communities and trying to help them bring down those direct dollars as well. Right. Let me uh, 